Transhumanism is a philosophy and a social movement that declares that humans should improve themselves through advances in science and technology. Nowadays, people behave as transhumanists without even realizing it. For instance, when they wear contact lenses or have laser eye surgery. Essentially, we've already become half cyborgs, combining the abilities of man and technology. What do you do when somebody asks you something you don't know? You reach into your pocket, Google the answer on your smartphone, and within a second you have access to all the knowledge humanity has accumulated throughout history. Or you might even ask Siri on your smartwatch. So, to be a transhumanist, you don't really need to implant a chip inside your body or have bionic prosthesis. But for me, the most interesting and important aspect of transhumanism is not about some fancy technology. The most inspiring for me is the idea that man has to fight against death, and that sooner or later we'll defeat it. Or that, at the very least, we will defeat the mechanism of aging, thus achieving something close to immortality. Why just close to? Because it's impossible to completely eliminate death from, say, a brick falling on somebody's head. Or is it? What if we were to download our consciousness onto a computer? In this video, the first in my series about transhumanism, I will talk about the opinion of some contemporary scientists regarding the different possibilities of achieving immortality, from regenerative medicine to cryonics and digital immortality. Let's go! Let's talk about the different ways to achieve immortality. Genetic engineering. Testing on animals has shown that, with the help of genetic engineering, it is possible to slow down aging considerably. For instance, in a species of worm, they discovered a gene responsible for aging. Through genetic manipulation, they managed to lengthen the life expectancy of this species by 10 times. Now, worms are such simple organisms that they only have one gene responsible for aging. Clearly, for humans, this is much more complicated. But then, there have been studies with more complex organisms, too. For example, with the help of genetic manipulation, scientists managed to raise the life expectancy of mice by 50%. And not only did the mice reach old age, but they were also healthy much longer. Of course, this is not a tenfold increase, but imagine just how much society would change if we could live just 50% more. Nowadays, the long-lived reach aged 120, Yet, we could live until 180 and still be successful athletes at 100. Theoretically, nothing is stopping us from identifying the genes responsible for aging in our body and from manipulating them, so as to allow us to live longer. In 2018, in China, two genetically modified babies were born thanks to CRISPR technology. But this is only the beginning. Ethical considerations will limit and even forbid experiments in this field, but research will still continue. Moreover, along with the manipulation of the genes that cause aging, genetic modification can help us avoid diseases. The Chinese children, for example, were programmed to be HIV immune. It would be possible to program people not only to live longer, but also to be resistant to a wide array of diseases and viruses. What's more, gene technology is becoming much cheaper and will soon become widely accessible. In 2003, the first ever deciphering of a human genome cost $3 billion. I had a DNA test not long ago, which cost less than $300. The fall in prices over 15 years has been colossal. The second possible way to immortality is through techno-maintenance of the human organism. Regarding this, you must absolutely watch my video podcast with Aubrey de Grey. Then the function of the brain will also automatically be the same as it was earlier in life. The greatest world expert on aging, with a Gandalf-like beard and all. Aubrey makes a very nice analogy between the aging of the human body and the wear of a car. Some experts say that the human body is just not able to live longer than 100 or 120 years. It simply wears out and it's not possible to effectively lengthen the lifespan due to the laws of nature and physics. But aren't there cars that work for 15 to 20 years, and then cars that are still around after 100? The cars in museum exhibitions, for example, or from private collections. Essentially, these cars get constant maintenance, are oiled regularly, their engine is repaired and replaced from time to time, they are well kept and treated with care, and their parts are replaced whenever needed. 
Aging, says Aubrey, is exactly like that. It's just the wear of the organism that accumulates through time. The various systems of our organism wear out and start going out of use. But by using them correctly and through techno-maintenance, it's possible to avoid this, or at least significantly lengthen the human lifespan. And it would be a healthy, disease-free life. Some opponents of transhumanism argue that while it might be possible to lengthen life a bit and be healthy and active at 100, sooner or later your brain would start deteriorating, you'd get Parkinson's and die. Aubrey says that it's incorrect to separate aging from diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative conditions. Because these pathologies are the inevitable results of aging, it's not them that we need to cure. Since they are incurable, we have to stop the aging of the organism's various parts before they deteriorate. This would allow us not only to live longer, but to live healthy and not fall ill, instead of living our entire lives like old people. Aubrey identifies seven types of damage brought about by aging. You can see them on the screen. Other studies identify nine types of damage. And for each of these types of damage, Aubrey and many other scientists are researching ways to prevent them. For example, stem cell therapy has already been proven effective against cellular atrophy in lab experiments. But there are many more possible experiments that could be done in regenerative medicine and nanomedicine. On this channel, I've already posted and will post more video podcasts with experts in these fields. There's very good data on exercise, at least with regard to median life expectancy and health span, there's very good data on exercise. True immortality is impossible because the universe will cease to exist one day. Often, transhumanists are associated with a particular way of seeking immortality, cyborgization. Imagine, one of your organs gets old, stops working, and you simply replace it with an artificial one. Not bad, is it? Organs that have already been successfully replaced by artificial ones include the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, and the liver. And you'll probably have heard about cyborgs with bionic prostheses that are no worse and are sometimes even better at getting along with their tasks than natural arms and legs. Paralyzed people who were able to walk again thanks to an exoskeleton or blind people who enabled their brains to process images through an optical device. It's possible that with time, we'll be able to fully replace the human body with an artificial one, by far superior in its functions. Here, one might ponder Theseus's paradox. If you take a ship, but start replacing the planks on its deck, the masts, the rudder, and all the other parts, when does it stop being the old ship and become a new one? For me, the answer is quite simple. I am my personality, my consciousness. My consciousness is the array of synapses in my brain. Essentially, I am just a bunch of information. This is why, no matter what I change in my body, I'll always be myself. Throughout all our life, our cells are renewing themselves. Every day, like Theseus's ship, we're changing, and in a few years I'll already be composed of almost entirely new cells. Yet, I'll still be myself. But then the logical question pops up. If all we are is information that can be expressed in a sequence of digits, why do we need physical bodies at all? All the ways to reach immortality mentioned so far have a shortcoming. They don't guarantee full immortality. What if a brick falls onto your head, or the exoskeleton supporting your entire body overheats and breaks apart, killing you as a result? This is where digital immortality comes in. Now, this is the single most controversial path to immortality. Transhumanists identify two methods of digital immortality. First, the direct scanning of the brain and its downloading onto a computer or a cloud. We'll get back to this. And second, the reconfiguration of personality based on digital footprints, like in Black Mirror, for example. There already have been attempts to do this. For example, a team from Luca, a startup in San Francisco, created a chatbot that reproduced the way of speaking of a friend of theirs, who has died in a car crash, using all his chats and all his posts on social media. Of course, this will only become reality in the very long term, but it looks very interesting. Here, the question also comes up. 
but it's just an imitation and not a real person, right? However, if one were to reconstruct all personality traits, as well as the ability to develop and learn, then it would be a bit more complicated. But the most correct form of digital immortality, I think, is the complete deciphering of the human brain and its upload onto a computer or cloud. This also is still far from possible, but then again, why not? If we truly are just the complex of our neural links, then we can just decipher them, transcribe them with digits, and keep them wherever. There are 86 billion neurons in the human brain, more than 100 trillion synapses. That's a lot. But it's just a question of time before computers will be able to process this amount of information. Again, the philosophical question pops up. Won't this be just a copy of me? We've debated this in my podcast with Alex Cadet, and a very interesting conversation came out of it. And at some point, you understand that the only one thing that you are is like information. The links in the description. Have a look. Finally, when we talk about digital immortality, we automatically also think of the possibility of merging the human brain and artificial intelligence. This is what Elon Musk, for instance, is doing with his project Neuralink. This is perhaps his most ambitious project. Its ultimate goal is to transform us from common people into real transhumans or posthumans with implanted interfaces, with computer brains. The project is already making progress. Experiments have been made implanting hyperfine cable systems in animals. These cables, together with a special chip, allow information to be sent to a computer much faster than any previous technology. These cables and chips have been implanted into animals and will soon be implanted into humans, without leaving any visible scars and without causing any inflammation. Within a year, experiments will begin on humans. As Musk has said, Neuralink technology has already allowed a monkey to control a computer with its thoughts. Soon, the same will be made available to paralyzed people, and then for people with other conditions. For example, this technology has the potential of helping the blind learn to see. In the further future, the plan is to achieve a full merging of man with artificial intelligence. Musk is convinced AI will sooner or later overtake man in its development. And if we are not to be left at the margins of history, we must unite the potentials of the human brain and technology. But even if you don't believe in the coming of transhumanism, Neuralink will nonetheless help millions of paralyzed people, sufferers of dementia and other brain conditions, blind people, and so on. This is not science fiction. The innovative technologies behind Neuralink have been employed for more than 10 years already, helping the paralyzed control their prosthesis or play video games through their thoughts. What's left to do for those who can't live until we defeat old age or merge with AI to become immortal? This is where cryonics can help. How exactly does cryonics work? After the heart and breathing stop, they freeze the body and replace the blood with a special substance called cryoprotector, so that the freezing does not damage the organism. The body, or alternatively only the brain, is then placed in a special vessel filled with liquid nitrogen at minus 192 degrees Celsius, or minus 313 Fahrenheit. Then, theoretically, you're just uh, chilling until science has progressed to the point of being able to unfreeze you and restart all the organism's systems. Science still does not know how to revive a cryonized patient. It's a gamble. But experiments are underway freezing and unfreezing animals, and they are starting to show very impressive results. They were able, for instance, to freeze dogs and unfreeze them after five hours. The procedures currently used by cryo companies are already ensuring that the damage caused by freezing is minimal. At first, I thought that cryonics was some kind of quackery, but having studied it in more depth, I now seriously take into consideration signing up for it, and I encourage my friends and loved ones to do the same. This is my plan B, in case we don't defeat old age within our lives. Of course, there are no guarantees, but the alternative is just to die, uh, therefore I think this is a gamble worth taking. Cryonics is a really complex and fascinating topic, and I'll definitely post a separate video on it a bit later. 
Surely, you'll still have lots of unanswered questions and objections. Please write them in the comments section. This is just my first video of a series on transhumanism. Look out for the updates, click underneath to subscribe or click the little bell button not to miss any news about future videos. And do support my projects on Patreon. Patrons receive access to exclusive content, for example my podcast on the ABCs of psychedelics, and also membership in my book club. The link is in the description below. I'm Greg Mastrider, see you next week.